we are now recording and thank you very much Matt for agreeing to give the Bogus Soul Seminar and it's all yours. Thanks. Okay. Um, so yes, um, I guess to introduce myself, um, I'm uh, Matt Lakin. I'm an assistant professor in um, computer science at University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. Um, and um, I'm also affiliated with um, the, uh, the chemical and biological engineering department in the Center for Biomedical Engineering, um, which is where, um, where I have my, my group has a, has a lab, um, in spite of being a, a, a trained computer scientist. So by, by tradition, I'm supposed to introduce myself a little bit, I guess. So um, uh, my background is computer science. I, I kind of got into, uh, well, initially DNA nanotechnology, which we'll all talk about. Um, mostly today, um, and more recently, synthetic biology and synthetic cells. Um, firstly, when I was a postdoc uh, working at Microsoft Research um, after I graduated, and then more recently when I came to, to UNM. So I'm going to talk today about some aspects of computation and information processing and how those might be applied to, I guess, controlled behavior of um, engineered cells and uh, synthetic cells. So the, 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 the broader background here is that um, the synthetic cell community, um, many, of, many of you listening, have been um, you know, in recent years working on uh, mimicking various aspects of, of living, living systems. Um, and many of these have kind of focused on uh, the, the sort of the fundamental, um, the fundamental capabilities you know, required for a thing to be considered alive, for a cell to be considered alive. So things like replication of, of, a, of a DNA, uh, DNA molecules, um, formation of cytoskeletal structure, um, even a, a division of a compartment into, into two, um, and um, um, chemical reaction networks uh, for um, and metabolism and, and photosynthesis to, to access the energy needed for the for the synthetic cell to, to live, to survive. Um, this, I guess sort of the, the broad claim of, 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 this, of this talk or of sort of the idea behind this talk is that if we want to produce synthetic cells that sort of do more than just, uh, more than just exist, um, then um, we kind of need to go a little beyond, beyond those, those, those core functions, right? So the core functions I showed in the previous slide are kind of the minimum, right? That you uh, that you might need to survive in a controlled environment, and then beyond that, there are adaptive functions um, that enhance uh, the proper possibility of surviving in a more general environment. Um, and the sort of the outer ring here, the the yellow is kind of the area that I'm going to sort of focus on in this talk. And the claim is that sort of you know, to do this, um, cells need to be able to exhibit complex behaviors. And in particular, they need to be able to uh, sense and, and compute and remember and, and process information in order to, um, uh, to, uh, to adapt and survive. Um, and the, 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 um, the, the sort of origins of this, of this idea stems from sort of the very earliest days of um, sort of microbiology, um, sort of in the late 19th or very early 20th century. Um, before, um, you know, before the advent of molecular biology and, um, and long before the understanding of DNA structure and the central dogma and so forth, uh, biologists were carrying out these kind of behavioral experiments on microorganisms, um, such as this one shown here, Stentor rosary. Um, and there's, a, there's sort of a fascinating literature on these things where people did things like squirting them with, with a chemical like sepia here on the left, and showing that this thing, which is sort of a single, a large single cell ciliate that can attach itself to a surface, will bend away uh, from the from the stimulus uh, that it that it doesn't like, that it, that it wants to try and avoid. Um, and there's a whole there's a whole range of these responses. So the thing will bend. It will try and sort of reverse the the the, the beating of the cilia to get rid of the, the the stimulus. It will sort of contract. And then finally, you know, if all else fails, it will detach. And one of the key um, findings in this early, uh, one of the key claims, I suppose, in this early experiments were, were the resolution of one physiological state into another becomes more rapid after it's taken place a number of times. And this is sort of 
characterized as a kind of learning right? in the, the, the cell. If you keep doing the same thing to it, it will, it will respond more quickly um, over time. Um, and more recent work has kind of confirmed this. Um, so these are some electron micrographs of this, of this particular animal being, um, being um, exposed to noxious stimulus. And firstly, it bends away from the, sort of the, you can see the capillary on the right there. It first bends away um, and then it kind of comes back. And then the second time it contracts um, and then it eventually detaches. So um, whether or not this thing is learning is, is not 100% clear, but it's certainly modifying its responses to the stimulus over time. Um, and there's the, the claim is that there is this kind of hierarchy of, of, of more extreme measures and it's kind of moving through this hierarchy. So bending away is, is less extreme than detaching and just, and just leaving the area completely. And more recent work, or uh, there have been more claims um, in sort of intervening years that various kinds of cell can learn, um, including paramecia and uh, physarum, which is slime, which is slime mold. Um, and these claims are arguably stronger for the physarum. And this is an example of one of the claims that if, you, if, you, if there is a nutrient source over there at the top and the cell is at the bottom, um, it will eventually learn to ignore this barrier, which it, it is unpleasant, but doesn't actually harm it in, harm it in any way um, in order to reach the food. The claim is that this, this is habituation, which is a form of learning. It's habituating to this stimulus. Uh, and another thing worth pointing out is, again, many of these claims have been contested because the single cell is very difficult to know exactly what is going on. Is there some other change in the experimental conditions that is causing uh, the, the modified behaviors? Um, and so sort of one of the, um, one of the research directions in sort of my group has been to look at um, how such behaviors might be realized in chemical systems, and in particular the type of chemical systems, I suppose, that could be used. Uh, to control synthetic cells, and the claim is that this requires some kind of information processing. Um, so, in the in the case of our kind of hypothetical synthetic cell, where there's this kind of uh, a cloud in the middle here that represents the the um, the the regulatory system, shall we say, of the synthetic cell, I won't sort of commit too much uh, on this slide to what that really is. Then, when this thing is stimulated. Um, some, some, some regulatory reactions take place inside, right? And then there's a response coming out the far side, these kind of green stars. Um, and perhaps in addition to, uh, you know, the, the sort of immediate response, uh, there is some processing happens and some updating of the state uh, within the synthetic cell happens. So this thing is sort of stateful, right? And this observing the stimulus not only causes a sort of a, a you know, a, an immediate response, but also, updates the internal state and maybe you have more of this memory molecule say produced which represents you know the um, some some encoding of what to do i suppose in response to this stimulus and then maybe if the stimulus is observed again then the presence of this larger amount of memory molecule means well that subsequently you're responding to this stimulus and it may be in a, in, a, in a stronger manner maybe in a weaker manner in the case of say the habituation um, uh, response but the key thing, I guess, from sort of um, my perspective would be in order to implement this, you need some kind of information processing reactions. And so I guess the question is, um, what might those look like and how might we implement them uh, in, a, in a system suitable for a synthetic cell? Um, and there's a number of answers to this question. Um, a lot of work obviously is done on um, uh, synthetic gene networks, gene regulatory networks, and you see there's been a number of talks in that um, in that vein in this in the seminar series in recent weeks and months. Um, my group does work on that uh, as well, um, but I'm not going to talk about that um, today. Today I'm going to talk about something slightly different that I've um, worked on for a little bit longer, and um, since I, since I was at Microsoft Research, and that is on a DNA-based molecular computing. And this is a slightly different approach to using DNA for um, biomolecular information processing, and rather than using DNA as sort of the genetic molecule, you know, that is, that is read and processed by, by proteins transcribed and so forth. Um, the DNA is, is really di a dynamic uh, molecule, right, that is really responsible for driving the, the, the behavior of the system. Um, and um, 
typically we're using shorter pieces of DNA, so DNA oligomers with on the order of 50, 60 base pairs, probably nucleotides kind of maximum, um, that are annealed into complexes such that they will undergo specific reactions when 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 uh, when activated. And this is kind of a this image is kind of a rendering of one such reaction. <clears throat> So I guess I, I guess I covered some of this. So the components in a DNA sort of molecular computing system are made of short, typically made of short DNA oligos, relatively short compared to genomic DNA. Um, and the way that they compute, well, the way they compute is they compute on data represented as the concentrations of certain free strands. So we're not synthesizing new strands or anything like that, although it's not in, not in, in this talk. Um, Rather, the strands are sort of there, but they're potentially bound to others uh, in, uh, in particular conformations. Um, and um, the concentrations of certain uh, strands free in solution, that is to say not complex or anything else, are going to represent our data. So they're going to represent numbers. Right? And the fact that DNA chemistry is, is combinatorial, sequence specific, means we can programmably design structures and we can abstract away the detail of their structures. So we can abstract away the detail of this, this 3D molecular structure to the sort of you know, the fairly well-known secondary structure representation in the middle here. Um, and we can go even further and abstract these secondary structures into called domains, uh, which are um, just sort of you know, using letters X and Y and so forth as shorthands for particular sequences that we assume are sort of non-interfering. And the star denotes um, what's some great uh, complementarity as usual. So one of the most common reactions uh, used to implement these systems is called DNA strand displacement. And this is a reaction um, whereby an input or an invader, which is the green strand here, displaces an incumbent, um, which is kind of a, the red one, uh, from a complex and, and uh, releases it into, into the solution. So whereas the input A is now free, it is free on the left in box one, um, the output ends up free in box in box three on the right there, um, and A becomes bound to to the blue strand in this complex Y. So we're we're not we're not creating new strands. We're just rearranging which ones are free and which ones are bound. And the way that rearrangement happens is via this what process is called toehold mediated strand displacement, and it's called toehold mediated because we have this this short overhang, so relatively short compared to the other domains, called a toehold. Uh, three and three star, uh, which are both exposed, single-stranded, both complementary, so they can bind uh, together, as sort of shown in the middle here. Um, and um, once this, this green strand is bound, we've got a, 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 a green two and a red two, which could both bind to this uh, blue complementary two star on the bottom here. And so we get this, um, this what's called branch migration, where the boundary point of which, of where the, the green blue bonds end and the red blue bonds begin, kind of moves back and forth. And the way that works in, in sort of mechanistically is we get breathing of the base pairs here. And then if this last red blue base pops up, then there's a, there's a probability rate that the red blue could reclose or the green blue could take its place. Right? So we get this random walk. Um, and eventually when we get to the other end, the last red, uh, red blue bond is broken and the red strand is displaced and the green one uh, sort of seals it off. And in this case, the reaction is irreversible because there is no, um, there's no way for, there's no free, um, there's no unbound basis for B to rebind to on this complex Y. So uh, in this case, there's a thermodynamic uh, drive toward completion of this reaction because you're forming these additional base pairs in the, the right-hand side as opposed to the left-hand side. Now, the thing that's really interesting about DNA strand displacement, or one of the things that's very interesting is that, um, if you write down a series of uh, chemical reactions that are called abstracts, and let's say we don't specify particular chemical species, um, but rather just say, well, there's, this, there's a thing called X and an X1, and say a thing called X2, and those two will react together to produce a new thing called X3. And we can write down um, you know, abstract reaction networks of that form. Then any, <clears throat> any such set of these abstract reactions can be compiled sort of automatically into a corresponding set of DNA um, strand displacement reactions. Um, and this is a result due to uh, Solovechik et al. Um, and 
essentially the way this works as I said we're, we're computing with um, <clears throat> we're computing with free strands and so the way that we, way that we implement this reaction is we kind of explode it out into multiple steps where these abstract species are represented by um, free DNA strands of a certain form in this case it's identified by this particular sequence of three domains, one, two, three for X1, four, five, six for X2, seven, eight, nine for X3. And then in addition to those species, there are uh, uh, multi-stranded complexes. So more complicated than the previous one with, with two or three or even more strands potentially um, that have been preformed. And those mediate the conversion of an X1, in this case, an X1 plus an X2 to do it to become an X3. And this happens in a multi-step um, you know, multi-step cascade, uh, the net effect, effect of which is to remove one X1 and an X2 from the system, they get bound up in this waste complex, um, releasing this intermediate, which then goes away and interacts with this waste complex to release this species X3 um, in solution. So the net effect is you've removed an X1 and an X2 and produced a free X3. And it turns out you can implement any, any such series sequence of reactions in this way. Um, for instance, this is this is again from, from the same paper uh, an example of um, of an, an oscillator, uh, an oscillating scheme of chemical reactions converted into the corresponding DNA uh, reactions and um, simulated, and um, sure enough, right, the the DNA reactions, the solid line sort of tracks the ideal reactions, the dotted line. So this this is a DNA strands and displacement reactions are sort of a fairly generic way to implement arbitrary chemical reaction networks. So, um, so for the rest of the talk, I wanted to just present a, a number of different projects that have been going on in my group in relation to this general area, both theoretical and experimental. Um, the first one that I want to mention has been um, work done with a grad student, David Arredondo, on uh, theoretical work on uh, learning in abstract chemical reaction networks of a kind um, they showed in the previous slide. And the goal of this work um, is to simulate a uh, trainable uh, two-layer nonlinear uh, neural network um, using a CRN. So um, this is an example of a neural network. So we have some inputs, um, X1 and X2. Um, these then feed into neurons in this sort of hidden hidden layer here uh, with weights. Um, the outputs from these neurons are then fed into output, the output neuron N2 over here, which produces some output signal. Um, and then each of these individual neurons, the N0, N1, N2s, look something like this. So they have some number of inputs. In this case, it's, it's, it's three for each of them um, that are weighted and summed and then passed through a, a nonlinearity, right, a nonlinear transfer function. And, and, and in this work, we used um, we implemented the, the, the hyperbolic tangent, tan h uh, transfer function, which looks like this. So it essentially squashes the, the input range into the um, into the um, the output range minus one plus one. And so to demonstrate, I guess the the power of what you can do with abstract these abstract chemical reactions. Um, this is the brief, the, the sort of the, the broad outline of how we how we go about this. So we we use um, a number of we use an oscillator in the background, sort of shown here in these these kind of rising and falling edges, to organize various species. So there's this autonomous oscillator going on, which um, which represents the clock, I suppose, of the sequence of reactions, and then different reactions that we want to happen at different times get catalyzed by different. Uh, clock species when a particular clock is high there's more of that species that reaction is catalyzed far more rapidly than the others um, and for instance we can catalyze say the the copying of an input the x1 input into multiple places in the network where it's required by just making that that reaction uh, be catalyzed by a particular clock species and these are the um, these are the, the these on the right are the um, are the corresponding um, sort of um, phases that the reaction goes through. The first one is um, finding out the inputs and computing the uh, output signal from the, the first layer neurons, actually the first and the second layer neurons, 
C is the third layer, is the second layer, the output layer, and then D is uh, the the learning, uh, the feedback, um, which updates uh, the um, which updates the weights on these neurons and is there, and is how the learning happens. So how do we implement these these individual neurons? Well, the first thing we need to do is to compute the weighted sum. This turns out to be relatively straightforward. It's relatively well known how you can do this um, using competitive chemical reactions. If I have an input x and a weight w, then I can I can essentially produce an amount y of the result. Uh, uh, okay, y is use, uh, y here is representing kind of the intermediate. Part of the output. It's a slight clash of terminology, I suppose. Um, but we can produce an amount of an output species, say y, that is the product of those two um, of those two input concentrations by having these two reactions. So w plus x catalyzes the production of y. And then x degrades, and as, and as x degrades at the same with the same rate constant, then if you um, if you form differential equations of this um, and solve them, you for the steady state you find the steady state is when y equals w times x. So that's relatively straightforward. The bit that's less straightforward is the nonlinearity of the, the hyperbolic tangent. Um, and so to implement this, we notice that. Um, if you take, you know, if you remember your calculus, right, the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent is one minus tan, the, the, the square of the, of the hyperbolic tangent. So d, d tan h t m d t is one minus tan h square of t. So you can represent the derivative in terms of the function itself. And that's interesting because it means if we, if we form a CRN, um, and, and this bit is not, is not due to us, if we form a CRN that looks like this, where t appears from nowhere, and t plus t um, collapses to a single t. And you can play tricks like this in these abstract CRNs because we, 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 we aren't bound by the laws of chemistry, I suppose. Then d, uh, the different, the, the, the derivative, first derivative of capital T with respect to time is one minus t squared. In other words, this thing traces out the hyperbolic tangent or the positive arm of it um, over time. But what we want is to have it sort of level off at, the, at a value corresponding to the hyperbolic tangent. How do we do that? Well, we know that we basically just need a stopwatch, essentially. Right? We need to run this reaction for uh, an amount of time that is uh, specified by, or a number of times, I should say, that is specified by some input species. And so the way we do that is using the catalyst trick again. So we use um, the, the result of the weighted sum, which we actually call net, um, to, um, to represent um, essentially a, a catalyst for these two reactions. So the T is becomes H0 in these reactions equivalent, but there's a catalyst called net zero. There's, a, there's another catalyst, the C5, which is the clock species. And then crucially, there's this degradation reaction for the, the net zero species. And what this means is, you, however much net zero you start with, when the, the C5 cycle begins, that's how, essentially how long you will run these reactions for. And then you will produce your output, which, in, which is H zero p here, as um, will be equivalent to the hyperbolic tangent of your of your input to net zero. And that second part is due to us. So, um, so how does this thing learn? Well, we learn in the system by an approach called weight perturbation, where we essentially take our inputs and our weights, we feed them into this abstract network. We also have a second copy of the network where we perturb one of the weights slightly. And this gives us essentially, we compute the, the network twice, but once with slightly different weight. And then we note that the difference between these two, um, the, the, the errors relative to a, the, the sort of the ideal target that we're trying to learn is going to be slightly different because the weights are slightly different. And this allows us to essentially uh, approximate uh, the loss derivative, so the, the derivative of the error with respect to that particular weight, um, which is just the difference between these two um, calculated error values, um, which we need because that feeds into our weight of data. So we use essentially a quadrature approach by these two networks, the main network and the shadow network, in order to uh, approximate the weight derivative, which allows us to carry out learning. And um, these are some results of simulations showing that this CRN can learn sort of all 16 of the uh, two input uh, Boolean functions. This is just showing the, the decision surfaces. Essentially, we train on the four corners, um, which represent um, the, the four possible 
the two input patterns of true and false. And we try and get the four corners to sort of be, be correct. Obviously, we can kind of do that in all cases. Um, and the most interesting one is arguably the XOR. Um, the reason why this one is interesting is that this is what's called not, it's, it's not what's called linearly separable. So you can't draw a single line between the positives and the negatives, a single straight line, I should say. So for example, you can do that here for this one. There's a single straight line. You can bisect this, this space such that all, the, the, all the, the ones are up here, the minus ones are down here, so the trues and the falses. For the XOR, you need two lines, right, like this, because you've got uh, a false uh, area, a true area, and then a false area at the, at the top. Um, and uh, so for this, you generally do, genuinely do need that two-layer network, which, um, which we were able to do. So the point being here, well, we can, we can show that CRNs can can, be, can implement these simple learning algorithms um, that could form the basis for similar behaviors in a study cell. And some related work that I won't say too much about in the interest of time, but I um, did so actually a little bit earlier, was to uh, design a strand displacement network. So this, this, these simulations were just done with abstract, extra abstract chemical reactions. We designed a, 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 an explicit DNA implementation of a similar algorithm um, that uh, didn't use the weight perturbation approach because it was trying to learn a, si a simpler function, namely um, uh, a single linear neuron, so one that learns a linear function rather than a, a nonlinear one. Um, and we were able to you know, train this in a similar way, get better error uh, over, over time, and also you know, these are just some traces of how the, how the system learns that match the, the expected behavior of uh, of, of the algorithm you're trying to implement. So this is this is a you know another important idea is that we can these these systems can be built to to learn and adapt um, sort of not sort of randomly I suppose but rather in response to a particular learning algorithm that they're programmed with, which is quite a powerful idea. Okay, so as I said, we can take these abstract circuits and we can in principle at least implement them in uh, in DNA. And so I wanted to talk about some work on experimental DNA circuits um, that was done in my group by a grad student, uh, Tracy Millet. Um, and this, um, this work came out last year on ACS, ACS Biology. Um, and one of the things that we're focused on in our work on DNA circuits in the lab is on robustness. So we want to be able to build circuits that um, uh, could survive in a, in, a, in a sort of relatively harsh chemical environment but still be able to control a synthetic cell, for example. Uh, and in this work, uh, we're using not just regular DNA, but also mirror image, chiral, chiral mirror image, LDNA, um, which is chemically the same, but stereoisomer, right? So the, by, by, by flipping the chirality of the, the sugars in the backbone, you get, you get a DNA molecule that, that twists the opposite direction than the naturally occurring DDNA one does. Um, and the reason that this is this is this is good for robustness is that whereas regular DNA can, is is most is is typically degraded in biological fluids um, such as the intracellular environment, the LDNA is not. The reason being that nucleases that occur in cells have you know have evolved to recognize the, the physical um, you know the physical confirmation of the naturally occurring DNA and not the other one. So if we could just build our our, our DNA devices out of LDNA, then we'd be sorted because you know, they, would be, they wouldn't degrade, is, is, the, is the theory. However, the problem is um, if I have a piece of LDNA and a piece of DDNA, they typically do not bind, uh, they do not they hybridize um, uh, via the standard base pairing rules. And that's because, well, the chiralities don't match, right? One of them is trying to twist one way, the other one is trying to twist in the opposite direction. So our solution, that to so what we would like to be able to do is be able to sense um, d d nucleic acid molecules using um, circuits that are primarily made of, of, of robust LDNA, um, and we do this by uh, implementing a sort of a hybrid chiral molecule, um, as shown here at the top. So these are molecules where there's a double helix, right? Um, part of it is in, is is of one chirality. 
And then at some point there's an interface where it starts to be the opposite karate and, and begins to twist in the opposite direction, twist back in the opposite direction. Um, and that, that kind of you know, cartoon is at the top there. Um, the way that we do this um, sensing is via the same strand displacement mechanism that I mentioned before. So we have an input of one chirality, say red, which might be D, um, that uh, undergoes a strand displacement up to this interface, releases this hybrid chiral inter in intermediate that then goes on and uh, undergo and then carries out a, uh, a second strand displacement that not only displaces this, um, this output Y, but also uh, displaces across this interface. Um, and then that Y uh, can now interact with a fully opposite chirality uh, reporter, say L, say LDNA, in order to produce a fluorescent signal. And so an input signal, can, uh, a free input of one chirality is consumed, and then an output of the opposing chirality is, is, is released in the, in the sort of terminology of, of, of before. And uh, does this work well? Well, well yes, it does. Um, and uh, these are some kinetic traces, these are some endpoints. So the point being is we can, we, we, uh, we can convert from D input to L output, from L output to D input, and then this is the control of D to D. Um, is this thing spe specific? So I claim that D, DNA, and LDNA do not interact. Is this thing specific? Well, yes, it is. Um, the way that we tested this was we take the normal, um, the normal um, heterochiral, as we call it, system. The blue one is D2L, the, the orange ones are L to D. And then that is sort of here on the left. And then uh, well, the right, the far right is just a control where it's just the reporter. So this is the, this is the, um, um, uh, this is the, uh, you know, the background fluorescence of the reporter, or reporter molecule itself. Um, and, um, and then the ones in the middle, uh, what happens if uh, we either swap the chirality of the input, or if we take one of these two gates, T1 or T2, and well, what we did was we just replaced it with the D to D version, which depending on which one of these this is, will either prevent it from accepting the input from above or produce a downstream um, output that does not match. So these are all sort of indistinguishable from the, from the background. Therefore, you know, we claim, well, that, you know, this thing is indeed chirally specific. Why is a kinetic different for L versus D? Um, uh, I'm trying to um, well, it, it's it's not really that the okay. So the, the difference to, to answer the question, the difference between so these two are basically the same. D D D going to L and L going to D um, are, as you can see, sort of here, pretty much the same. Um, the absolute numbers are uh, slightly different because the, the L and D reporters are slightly, slightly different in terms of that they were synthesized by slightly by, by different companies. So they're not quite the same um, in terms of the fluorescence kinetic characteristics. The one that's different is the one that doesn't have the chiral interface. So although the reaction does proceed across the interface, we think it's a bit less efficient than the version that doesn't have that and have that in the way. So that's why the, that, that's the reason for that. Good question. Um, okay, so yeah, so this thing is currently specific. We can kind of show it with some of these controls. Um, does this interface affect the stability of the gates? Well, not too much. We see sort of maybe a, a few degrees decrease in the uh, melting temperature if we if we do um, UVVIS measurements on on the the homochiral version of green versus the uh, the ones that have this D2L or L to D um, interface in them. So they're, they're, they're slightly lower, but not, 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 not hugely so. Um, oh, and, and this system, by the way, is, 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 is based on a design right, by uh, Wang Natal from a few years ago. And the reason why this is a good design is that it, because it uses this two-step translation process, um, it is uh, what's called leakless, so we have very low uh, unwanted activation of the gates. You can kind of see that here. Without input, there's basically no, no signal released at all. The reason for that is because of that two-step process, the toehold that needs to be that would need to be released to leak is buried deep inside the gate. And the only way to, uh, to see a leak 
is to essentially have this, this unstable uh, uh, multi-component complex form. Uh, so you essentially need a tri-molecular re tri reaction to occur uh, in order to get a leak. So that's why the leak here is quite low. And that's, uh, that, that's of interest to us because we're interested in, in robustness, right? We want to have these things be robust and not degrade. Um, and so we, we did some experiments with these things in, uh, in serum, serum supplemented media. And um, what we basically did was, well, we incubated the D to D and the D to L version of the system in, 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 in media and see, well, what happens uh, after 24 or 26 hours um, after you've incubated them. Um, and with the D to D version, you see a much stronger amount of leak coming out than you do with the D to, oops, with the D to L version. And the reason for that being is when you, when you degrade these DDNA pieces, some of, you, some of them are going to degrade this reporter and are going to release fluorescence. In the D to L version, uh, you're, you can partially degrade the DDNA versions. We don't think the L DNA pieces get degraded. And that means that you, where you have some of these um, blue pieces released, um, they, can't, they aren't sufficient on their own because of the circuit design to interact with this output and produce the, the resulting fluorescence um, that you might see. So you see a little bit, uh, but not too much. So the, the, the claim is these are, these are uh, better than sort of pure D, D DNA uh, gates uh, for, um, uh, for uh, implementing these types of computations in um, biological fields. Are you talking a few more minutes? Um, so the last one, the last bit I want to talk about sensing uh, inputs. This was a work of a, a former uh, grad student, um, Aurora Fabry Wood. And this was just, so I want to talk about this because it's the only, it's sort of the, I, I can show some, some uh, fluorescence microscopy images of, of, of membranes um, because that's pretty much the done thing in synthetic cell, synthetic cell world. Um, and so the work, this work was on sensing of, of, of inputs um, stimuli by uh, DNA components in uh, these, um, I guess, um, microfluidic generated uh, compartments. Um, and so we work, this work was done in collaboration with a number of groups at UNM and, uh, and colleagues at Columbia University who isolated um, uh, DNA aptamers against um, various uh, membrane permeable steroid molecules, such as uh, deoxycorticosterone, DC, and cortisol, which we call CS. Um, and so we have these two um, uh, aptamer um, uh, structures. Um, each of them has a fluorophore and a, and a, a sort of a partially complementary uh, strand carrying a quencher. And the idea is in the absence of the ligand, um, the folding uh, equilibrium favors the, the binding of this quencher because this stem is, is, sort of, is, 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 is free over here on the right um, in, this, in this first one in part A here. But then when the, in the presence of the, of the, the, the corresponding ligand, um, the folding favors the formation of this structure here and this stem in particular, which displaces this, whoops, which, um, which shifts the equi equilibrium toward displacement of this quencher and therefore increased fluorescence. Um, and so we have two of these, these, these aptamers for these two inputs. Um, and we put these, we use, we use these in uh, uh, GUVs, giant unilamella vesicles, and you can see the size of these things are really quite large, right, 100 micron radius or thereabouts. Using a microfluidic device, this, which is sort of a nested capillary system. We have the inner aqueous phase, um, which contains, in this case, the, um, 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 these, these uh, uh, aptamer quencher molecules in the inner aqueous here. Um, and then the oil phase, the DOPC lipid, um, comes in around it. And then this is pinched, pinched off by this uh, outer uh, aqueous phase with PVA, um, which stabilizes these, um, these, these GUVs in the collection tube on the right. And this is just an image of one of those. 
No, oh, sorry, another question. Does DNA atom are different encapsulated in vesper institution? Um, I think in general, yes, they do. I think you need to be encapsulating them in something far smaller than these GUVs in order to um, in order to see those effects. But yes, in nano, I think in far smaller uh, compartments, yes, they, yeah, there are the, the edge effects in particular come into play a lot more here. This thing is, you know, to all intents and purposes, you know, it's far larger scale than the scale of the individual molecules. So not much, uh, not much different. Anything. Good question there. Um, and here's a here are just some of some of the images and the corresponding fluorescence numbers extracted from them. So these are um, these are sensitive to the specific. You know, these two these two atomic systems are sensitive. To one or the other of the of the uh, um, of the ligands, as per their um, uh, you know, depending on which of the of the aptamers is in, or if both of them are in, then it will respond to the point. But like actually, I think this is this is just single aptamer per, per per thing. But you can see the point being the the the, the, the compartments keep them in, um, and they don't sort of leak everywhere, which is what we want. Um, and uh, the final data right here, I guess, here is just to prove is just to demonstrate that um, we can um, that the, the presence of the um, of the membrane um, protects the aptamers from either uh, denaturation by DNAs. So these are ddNA aptamers again. These are not DNA aptamers. So DNA uh, uh, DNAs uh, one. Um, Digestion, um, or or just interaction interacting with a uh, um, um, uh, um, a, a complementary nucleic acid, just the, the anti aptamer essentially um, that would otherwise just bind to the whole thing and displace the uh, displace the the quencher and give you lots of fluorescence. So um, let me try and remember how one of these plots show. Um, so if we denature the DNA, something happens. If we have functional DNAs. Um, in the absence of of the of the um, um, of the of the compartment, so that this actually addresses your previous question. Um, what the name of the person who also asked the question, Anders, um, which shows that yes, well, they work. The 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 aptamers do kind of work similarly, with, both in and within the compartment, and not. Um, and um, so the DNA activates the fluorescence almost as much as the cognate steroid. The anti the anti aptamer doesn't activate quite so much, um, but it does activate a decent amount. And then, um, but then in the in the um, in the presence of um, the the the, uh, the 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 membrane, well, you see no 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 activation from the functional DNAs one or the complementary nucleic acid. You do see strong activation of the steroid because the steroid is able to permeate, permeate the membrane, right? Diffuse across the membrane and then interact with the, with the aptamer inside. Um, but you also see um, response in the presence of both the DNAs and the steroid. Um, so that the, to, to, I guess to this one there is demonstrate to make the point that the DNAs is not is still not sort of inhibiting its effect, I suppose, of, of the steroid on the aptamer. Um, so that you know that th this was just to uh, to to make the point that yes you know these DNA these DNA circuits can be built they can be built to do complex things they can be realized with um, with DNA and strand displacement networks and those networks can um, you know, be can be activated across the membrane for instance via um, these uh, these these steroid signaling molecules. Um, and I think that's more or less all I have time to time for today. So in conclusion, um, so information processing, which I've been trying to address today, offers a route to engineer lifelike behaviors in the synthetic cells, such as things like learning and uh, intelligent, quasi-intelligent adaptation. Um, and there's a number of, that's a number of ways that can be done, um, including by this DNA-based molecular computing mechanism. And I think you know, going forward, a key thing is going to be how can we implement how can we implement the connection right between sort of information processing networks like this with um, the the broader behaviors of, of a synthetic cell. So it's one thing to produce some fluorescence right, in response to 
um, uh, stimulate and make it much more interesting to change how a synthetic cell uh, conducts itself, shall we say, um, in response to stimuli. And that would be that would be a question of linking the outputs of these circuits right to the behavior of the synthetic cell itself, which would be very interesting. So I'd like to sort of end the obligatory acknowledgements, uh, etc. Uh, so the collaborators on this work, um, Dalko Stefanovic, who's at, at UNM and myself, Milan Sanovic, who's whose group at Columbia developed the, the steroid aptamers, uh, Steve Graves and Gabriel Lopez and Nick Carroll, who were involved in the, the, the microfluidics aspect of, of that project. Um, members of my group, in particular those whose, whose work we featured are, are, are in bold face there. Um, funding from NSF, multiple NSF awards, and uh, other sources, including uh, UNM institutional funds, startup funds. Uh, these, if you're interested, this is my, my uh, lab web page. I think the link is also on the Builder Cell page and uh, my email. Um, and we are, we are hiring. We're, we have um, various um, new NSF uh, uh, grants in both synthetic cells and in UNM technology with a postdoc and PhD student position available. So um, with that, um, yeah, uh, thank you for your attention and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, Matt. That, that is an awesome talk. I have a couple of questions myself, but uh, there are questions in chat. I want them all. Can you? Uh, uh, oh, OK, I have to zoom out. I'm going to make it bigger so I can read them all. Tustin Intimate, okay, you dealt with that one, dealt with that one. Matt Zero, did you ever try to put membrane channels in liposomes, such as see if the steroid or DNA will activate inside liposomes and channels? Um, we did not, I don't think, ever try to put a membrane channels in the liposome. Um, it can be done. Um, there's been plenty of work uh, on, on doing those. Um, the reason why we... Um, uh, well, there's another reason why we didn't want to do that. Firstly, um, well, we we kind of wanted the the, the 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 compartment to be isolated from the surrounding. Um, so that was part of the part of the idea of doing these experiments on uh, um, with with the steroid inputs. Right, was because they could diffuse passively over the membrane. They didn't need. You know they didn't need to uh, uh, to have a to have a channel to let them in, basically. Um, I hope that answers your question. I mean, if the short answer is no. No, we did not. Boy, I have two questions. What do you think is a difficult experiment? Experimenting, implementing, experimentally implementing theoretical neural networks here. Study. Uh, I think that's just the size of the networks. Um, I think. Um, well, okay, there's, I mean, there's, there's two, I mean, they're really related. Uh, in the general case, the size of the networks that you need to build is, is kind of a key one. Um, um, in particular, because in order to do this, you need sort of a multi, you need sort of to be able to do multiple rounds of this, right? Uh, multiple rounds of this training, if you want to look at it that way. Um, and um, while there have been, you know, fairly large, DNA, net, DNA implementations of neural networks. Um, um, none of them have had, have had that capability as far as I'm aware, sort of thus far. Um, so that's one. Two, this one is a bit general. For building this components of synthetic cells, I think there's any advantage of using DNA and components. Ah, okay, so you mean using DNA, DNA nano, nano, whatever, DNA networks of this of strand displacement networks of this form. Um, compared to, say, um, a genetic network. Um, do I, um, yes, I think there probably are some advantages. Um, I know there has been some work done recently of using these DNA reactions as a readout for um, um, cell-free TXTLs systems because of the speed of the kinetics can be, can be faster. Um, I think you you do have certain aspects in terms of sorry advantages in terms of um, the um, the the fact that the ability to engineer sort of a precise base pair level you know how these things are going to work um, so that would be another 
can you differential equation kinetics on the x phase liposomes? Um, and in theory, I suppose um, we did not, um, we didn't really have a great way of, of, of tracking individual liposomes over time um, when we did this. But if you did, then yes, you probably could. Did you try other membrane compositions? Um, probably. Um, a membrane, lipid membrane stuff is really not my wheelhouse. So um, that was the, the collaborators on the slide were largely dealing with, um, with that side of things. So um, if they were here, I would defer that question to them, but they're not, so I apologize. Um, we have played with other membrane compositions. You know, we did some other experiments I didn't talk about. With, essentially affixing some of the, the, the strand displacement components to the surface of the membrane and showing that you could sort of run the strand displacement reaction on the membrane surface. Um, and we did play with the lipid concentrations there because there we were interested in things diffusing on the membrane and stuff like that. So that was important. But here, I don't think we did. I think we just used whatever, whatever it was, DOPC, something like that. As I said, really not my area of expertise. Um, and lastly, okay, how would you with DNA degradation by rep BCD of the nucleases? Um, well, I guess there's a number of ways that can be handled, right? So, firstly, we could use our LDNA gates, and, and those they offer some robustness there. Um, secondly, I mean, well, there are ways to there are ways to to mitigate um, that um, you know that have been developed for the, the purpose of using, you know, um, um, you know, linear products, right? Linear PCR fragments in, in TXTL with GAMS, GAMS um, inhibitor protein or chi DNA to titrate, you know, the rep PCD complexes away from your the DNA you actually care about and so forth. So I suppose we can use those in if we wanted to do um, similar things to, to this. Um, no, no more questions. No, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem um, like it. You said, did you no have more a question? questions? In, yeah, I do. Um, it's more of a theoretical question. What do you think is the limit of complexity for the strand displacement control? Can you have 50 different of those gates at once? You mean, I mean, in practice? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I know theoretically there's no limit, but oh yes, yeah, so theoretically there's no limit, right? In in practice, um, yeah, it's good. Work. Can you have fifty gates? Um, probably. I mean, the the limit is more on the number of, of sort of distinct signals, right? Because those that's kind of where your sequence space kind of just sort of go, sort of you know, we it all the um, I'm trying to say it. So like, let me, let, me just, let me just go back through my slides here and try and find the slide that, that would kind of address this. Uh, where would be here somewhere. So like here, for instance, so the, the sequence, the, the, the sequences kind of get used up mostly in uh, differentiating these signal, these species, the abstract species, as it were, the signals, the X1s, X2s, and so forth. So for those you, you know, and, and, the, and most of the rest of the, no, the sequence of the other complexes kind of follow from those, if you will, right? So, um, yeah, I, I mean, there is going to be a limit in terms of, well, for the size of, of, of oligo you're looking at, how, how big, you know, how, 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 many, how many sequences are there that are, um, um, you know, sufficiently distinct, right? That you aren't getting too much cross interference. Um, I think, I mean, I think fifty might be doable. I mean, um, the people who are really at the forefront of this, or probably the, the person who is really at the forefront of this, is, is Lu Lu Chen, and they've been doing some really quite large um, strand displacement networks, sort of neural, neural network type. Um, I don't know quite how much, how many they have. Uh, offhand sort of you know in, in a single tube um, but I think it is getting up it is getting up there so um, 
Uh, uh, yeah, you. so I mean, I think there there is going to be a limit for sure, um, but I uh, I think it it, it could be um, it could be reasonably large. And there are other there are other approaches that I haven't um, that I didn't talk about here. Um, so you, there's been some really nice work um, on um, essentially rather than running these. So these gates are I, I didn't say like kind of assume assume that you would imagine that these 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 different gates pieces would all be um, freely diffusing in the solution i guess i kind of hinted at it a brief point but but they, they are that's the intent here um but there's been some very nice work done where you can take some of these pieces and um and and immobilize them on the dna surface like say say a dna origami tile at certain positions and then you actually do get you know, something more like an actual circuit, right, where you activate this one and it's like a domino effect, right, that kind of transmits a signal across the across the surface. And it's been shown that, you know, um, you know so some, some logic, logic circuits and stuff can be computed that way as well. Um, and there, this, this sequence issue kind of goes away to an extent because you can reuse the same sequence in multiple different part places on your, on your tile, right? Because you have, because you have, because now you have the um, the physical location, right? Can, can encode where in the circuit that piece is. The problem with these these solution phase circuits is you don't you, know, you lose that, right? So you have to encode it in the sequence, and then you run into this issue of well, eventually you're going to run out of sequence. So in principle, you could scale that way as well, which would be very interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. I would love to see that. Um, yeah, there's been some nice work on that by like Georg Seelig did some and John Rice as well. So yeah, definitely an interesting, interesting area. All right. Um, thank you very much. We're coming up top at the hour. So I want to thank you again very much for the seminar. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thanks everyone for, for listening. And Thanks, everyone, and have a great week. Yeah. Bye. Bye.